my cord on this computer. Okay, welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum and we're delighted to have with us today um, Tim Fanning. Tim is an author and um, a contributing journalist to various publications in Ireland, including the Irish Mail on Sunday and the Irish Times. We were in UCD together back in the day, although we didn't really know each other. It was a big university, um, but we did apparently have some classes together. Um, this is part of our continuing the Irish and series. And today we're looking at the Irish uh, in particular with Latin America and uh, Tim, uh, the historian, has written several books, uh, four uh, that have been published, The Salamanca Diaries about Father McCabe and the Spanish Civil War, Paisanos, which we have for sale in our store, Paisanos, The Forgotten Irish Who Changed the Face of Latin America, The Feathered on Sea Boycott, which is a, a whole other thing, and then his latest book is Don Juan O'Brien, an Irish adventurer in 19th century uh, Argentina, I think you said? South America. South America, okay, good. Yeah. So um, today uh, we, we're pre-recording this talk just to give a flavour to uh, what was a very different experience, Tim, for the Irish uh, immigrating to Latin America. And I suppose started earlier, you know, this is kind of a surprise, I think, for many people. We always, of course, hear of the huddled masses in New York and Boston, but there was earlier departures for Latin America. There was, um, I suppose, the they were more sporadic, perhaps, and the earliest arrivals mostly came through Spain and Portugal. I, I, I've done some research in this and I think perhaps the earliest um, Irish arrivals in the Americans after the Europeans discovered it was uh, there is there is some evidence that points to three Irish cabin boys being on one of the ships um, that took part in um, Magellan's uh, expedition. Wow. In <clears throat> so that's the earliest evidence that I've come across, mm -hmm. um, but really, really the first Irish that come to to what we know, what is now South America and Central America, um, and even parts of what is now the United States, such as Florida, mm -hmm. um, would they would have come through through Spain. So there have been Irish emigrants who were forced to leave Ireland for political and religious reasons. They found um, a new home in in Spain, mm. and then they became part of the Spanish colonization of South Central America. Um, primarily, the, the the first ones really as missionaries. Mm. So some of the some of the among the most famous um, Irish emigrants, if you like, to or colonizers, perhaps mm. is a better word. Um, to to go to South America is a priest called um, Thomas Fields, uh, and he ended up in in Paraguay. And he was a precursor to the. He was a Jesuit, and he was a precursor to the Jesuits that founded. He was one of the first Jesuit priests in this, what is now Paraguay, southern Brazil, northern Argentina, and he he kind of um, laid the groundwork for the. The foundation of the famous <clears throat> Jesuit missions, which anyone who's seen will, will know the story through the the, the Robert De Niro film yeah. uh, from the nineteen eighties. Yeah. Um, so the, the the early the the earliest Irish to go to to South America were were missionaries. Um, part of the 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 the, the ideological um, <clears throat> the ideological reasoning, I suppose, behind the conquest of South America was the the evangelization of the indigenous peoples and um, a lot of Irish priests who would have studied in, in Spain mm -hmm. would have ended up in right across South America, uh, Central America, Mexico, and in territories that now are part of the United States, such as Texas and um, California. New Mexico, the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, so those those priests, those 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 missionaries are amongst the earliest. Mm -hmm. There are also you also find um, there are traders, tobacco planters, and traders in Brazil in the early part of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. So there are some um, plantations in the north coast of Brazil. You find some Irish settlements there 
some some working for the the Portuguese, some working for the English. Um, so there's there's a kind of a sporadic um, emigration to South and Central America, primarily though through 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 Spain. Hmm. And so those... and that's that's the early part, kind of the 17th yeah. century. These are the these are the immediate uh, 16th, early part of the 17th century, the, the kind of the hundred and the hundred years after after Columbus. Yeah. So I mean, these experiences are probably you know very problematic. Like it's interesting to hear colonizer, you know, in, in conjunction with what we think of as immigration for the Irish. You know, we we never saw ourselves in that kind of category, I guess, but those early Catholic ones. So would they have been the children of pretty wealthy people in Ireland that, you know, are because of the penal laws, they're being sent to Spain to be educated? Exactly. Well, I mean, going back to your colonizing point, first of all, I think it's interesting that, you know, we tend to see ourselves very much as people colonized yeah. um, by the English. But in fact, we have this history that's not particularly well known. Um, yeah uh in which we i mean obviously later on the 19th century um you know we we participate in british colonization but there's this history of the irish participating at all levels um mm. but mainly you know it, whereas you know you see you know there's the, the stereotype of the irish soldier in the 19th century um in the british army the the the, the type of soldiers that participate in the colonization of South America, Central America, in the the eighteenth century, which is a bit further on. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is they are they are the children, or they are related to um, either the Irish, the Catholic gentry, um, and you know they come from a class that's been displaced mm -hmm. uh, in Ireland that has had to an ambition. You know, they're 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 ambitious people that. That look towards Spain, France, um, because they have no opportunities left to them because of their religion in Ireland, mm -hmm. and they're they're also a network that's 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 uh, that they, they kind of build a network in Spain. They have members of their class um, are very um, uh, uh, powerful in the the court in Madrid. Um, mm -hmm. One there's one particular. Um, Irishman by the name of Richard Wall, who becomes effectively Prime Minister of Spain in the middle of the 18th century. He's a soldier who works his way all, all the way up through the Spanish administration. And it's through people like this that they, they develop a network mm -hmm. that in the army, in the Spanish administration, that allows them to promote um, their fellow Irishman. This is the reason for the name of my book, Paisanos, their fellow countrymen. Mm -hmm. to positions of 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 power in Spanish America. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is that in the 18th century, you know, period of revolution, turbulence across the Atlantic, when the Spanish are um, very afraid that they're going to lose their empire um, mm -hmm. to the French or the British, um, primarily the British they're scared of, they're, 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 they're putting Irish soldiers, Irish officers into positions into key positions in strategic positions throughout um the Americas. So they're they're putting them into places in in Florida, they're putting them into they're putting them into say the the Pacific coast um areas they they deem vulnerable to attack mm -hmm. by the British, um, which I think points to the fact that they believe that the Irish have a particular set of not to to to, to paraphrase Liam Neeson the <laughs> skills yeah uh, uh, <laughs> to allow them to let them navigate mm -hmm. perhaps between this kind of Spanish need to control and authority but also to mediate with the people on the ground for instance particularly in Florida mm. you know Florida flips back and forth between mm -hmm. British rule Spanish rule um, mm. and you have a lot of English speaking residents there at the turn of the 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 nineteenth century, mm -hmm. so I think what the crown does, the Spanish crown, is it's, it appoints Irish soldiers who are fully you know absolutely committed and loyal to the Spanish crown, mm -hmm. but also understand um, something of Britain, can probably speak English, 
Mm -hmm. um, are culturally perhaps more attuned to the inhabitants of these territories that the Spanish, through treaties, you know, throughout the 18th century, various territories in the Caribbean flip back and forth, and the Spanish are desperately trying to find people that can can understand mm -hmm. the settlers of those territories. So that's that's what I think is particularly interesting. So you find <clears throat> you find Irish soldiers rising to positions of great power in in South America, in mm -hmm. particular. Ambrose O'Higgins, who, who comes, who's the, the son of uh, tenant farmers in, in, in born in County Sligo, mm. he emigrates to Spain in his thirties. So he's a relatively, you know, he's, he's he's not a young man when he he goes to Spain. Mm -hmm. He works in a trading company initially in a, in a you know in a fairly fairly lowly position, but he's 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 determined, ambitious, and he he finds a role for himself in. In, in Chile as an engineer, and then he becomes a soldier and he works his way up until he becomes Viceroy of Peru, which is wow. effectively um, the king's man governing huge sway in South America. So he's the most important man in South America at the end of the 18th century. Wow, yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I mean, my European history is so rusty at this stage, but, you know, when you were, you were talking about kind of continental Europe and all the faffing around, you know, between sort of the the mainland wars, of course, you know, Franco, Germany, that's a little bit later, but it's earlier too, the Swedish are fighting, you know, so Spain really kind of concentrated and Portugal to an extent on, on Latin America, really, the new world. And I know there was a little bit of tussle over, you know, the oh, Netherlands and Belgium and yeah. all that too, but um, with the Bourbons, but they obviously kind of were concentrating on the, the new world because of the riches that they could, you know, bring back home, I guess. Well, yes. I mean, there's also, I mean, what you see as well in the 18th century is a lot of Irish concentrate in places like Cadiz in the south of Spain. Yeah. Um, and they begin to take for themselves a fairly significant section of um, commercial activity there. Okay. So you've, 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 for instance, in the 18th century, you have Spanish merchants in places like Lima complaining because the Irish have taken such a significant portion of of trade between wow. Peru, which is the most important part of the empire, mm. and Spain. Um, so again, it's 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 the Irish network seizing that space, see, network and seizing that that seizing the opportunities um, yeah. that ex I mean it, that exist at that moment. And also, you know, they're 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 very much, um, you know, they they're very much. This is a a moment in time when. The Spanish are struggling to to hold on to the empire. They'll yeah. they'll lose the empire yeah. by the 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 early years, the the the, the third decade dec decade of the nineteenth century. Mm. Effectively, most of South America has become independent of Spain, and the Irish can see that the the, the winds are changing, and, and yeah. they take advantage. Well, and that's I was going to ask you that. So the the initial demographic we said are, are Catholic, sometimes quite wealthy, but in the likes of you know Ambrose O'Higgins, who kind of came from more. Um, uh, well, Am Ambrose Higgins comes from most of these. Most of these, the 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 these people, they come from. They they're well connected, yeah. if you like. Uh, um, uh, but they 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 they're penniless, so they're looking yeah. for you know they're 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 looking. They can for take advantage of a system like that will reward them. I guess you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're 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 looking in the early part of the 18th century for opportunities in the army, mm. in commerce, and. A lot of them find it in mm -hmm. in the army in in Spain, and then their careers are furthered through their mm -hmm. the network emanating out of um, out of Madrid, and they can mm -hmm. find opportunities in 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 South America, and then subsequently they they help nephews and sons. I mean, yeah, and Rosa Higgins is is first of all he becomes intendant of Concepcion, which is the uh, Concepcion, which is the second city in in Chile. Then mm -hmm. he becomes governor of Chile. Then he becomes Viceroy of Peru, and all the while he's he's helping nephews and um, cousins and various mm -hmm. people, various soldiers who are coming, being brought out from Spain to okay. South America because there's opportunities for them there. Yeah, um, and and at the same time, a lot of them have commercial interests. Yeah, so you know it's interesting in a way, I suppose, that Spain, in particular, being a Catholic power, and maybe to an extent at times France. And we see this with, you know, the 
what were they, the wild geese and stuff. This was an opportunity for Catholics who were not necessarily wealthy, particularly using the army in a way that the British army, you know, was not because they wouldn't really have been welcome in the British army as Catholics, you know. So it's natural, I suppose, to deviate to the other power that would accept you, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, uh, when in, in the in, during the penal laws in mm -hmm. the 18th century, um, these ambitious Catholics have to find, as I said, they have to find new opportunities in Spain. And Spain is incredibly generous to the Irish, mm -hmm. but they also need their particular uh, skills. They're 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 recognised as very able soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a place for them in Spain, and then as uh, Spain, you know, the Spanish Empire at that time is is vast. Um, it, you know, it, 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 uh -huh. it stretches from. In the south of Chile, south of Argentina, all the way up to California, um, Louisiana. Um, so they're in desperate need of manpower. And that's how a lot of uh, talented Spanish soldiers... I mean, the difference between, for instance, the 18th century, a lot of... You'll find that the Irish officers who find themselves in positions of great authority in, in the Americas tend to be there on merit. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of the a lot of the Spaniards tend to be there because of their names and mm -hmm. their ancestry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Tim, you know, as we're talking, it's kind of just striking me how it seems like these um, this diaspora are like cutting ties with home. You know, like you hear a lot the the Fenians, you know, attempted to invade Canada. This is after the American Civil War. You know, there's almost always a. a an image of uh, American Irish and Irish who have been deported to um, Australia, for instance, like wanting to come home, particularly the ones with the military experience, that they'll bring back this, you know, knowledge. These guys that were generals, you know, of an empire don't seem to ever think, like, why don't we go well, back to nothing, Ireland and fight? There's the nothing British? for them at that stage at home. So I suppose Even that's to the win reason. freedom, though. <laughs> Like well, that that well that comes later. Yeah, I mean, oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. What 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 happens? One of the perhaps most interesting stories which forms the central part of my book Paisanos is that um, large contingents of of Irishmen um, go and fight in the wars of independence so while yeah. in the 18th century you have these soldiers who are who owe everything to Spain their education in Spain they're um, you know they find positions in within it's, it's worth pointing out that Spain creates um specific Irish regiments for these soldiers that that leave Ireland um, yeah. in the Spanish army. So people like Ambrose O'Higgins, who becomes Viceroy of Peru, um, is fiercely loyal to Spain. Yeah. Um, but then in the early part of the 19th century, um, you begin to see the first uh, stirrings in the wars of independence. Um, and as they progress, people like Bolivar in Venezuela and Colombia is in desperate need of manpower to mm. fight the Spanish. Mm. Um, and he turns to to London and he looks he goes looking for for soldiers, officers and soldiers and he in in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars he he recruits um an awful lot of Irish soldiers, hundreds of Irish soldiers at least, oh. um, and officers um, to fight in throughout South America in mm -hmm. the, the wars of independence, which lasts, you know, which begin in 1810 and, and last until the middle of the 1820s, 1830. Yeah. So you have ships going from, sailing from ports across Britain and Ireland with Irishmen going off to fight in South America. And, yeah. and why are they why are they going off to fight in South America again? There's not much for them at home. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of them, some of them are are demobilized soldiers who've been fighting on in Europe. Mm -hmm. Some of them are adventures. Um and some of them are motivated. You know, there are people like Daniel O'Leary, mm. who's um very close to Bolivar. He's he's in fact his biographer, um, fights throughout Colombia and Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And he's very motivated by um, 
these ideas of liberty. Uh, you know, this is the this is a period in post um, American Revolution, post French Revolution, where all these ideas are yeah through right. the Atlantic, and they're mm -hmm. very much they're very much motivated by these ideas of 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 liberty and freedom and and it, and 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 perhaps don't know what they're getting into because yeah. they're sold on dreams of wealth. Bolivar and his his men or his agents promise great wealth and land and a kind of a utopia mm. where uh, in South America that once um, Venezuela, Colombia have been liberated from Spanish rule. Mm. Um, then everyone's going to be happy. They're going to have hundreds of acres to farm and they're going to be be happy ever after but it doesn't quite work out that way when they get to the Caribbean they yeah. end up in 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 an island off Venezuela and they start to die from various tropical diseases wow. and the conditions on the ships across the Atlantic are horrendous and they don't have the right equipment and mm. in yeah. many respects the Spanish are better trained so but there is there are there are quite a few veterans for instance of the 1798 rising Mm. amongst their number and so they there is a a strong irish participation yeah. in these wars of liberation in 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 uh in the early part of the 19th century yeah but you know it, it's striking to me that they are it seems set on their new life like in what was the new world you know that there, there isn't this desire to then come home to ireland and fight the British out, even though they have all this military experience, you know. Online. Oh, there, are there, I there. It it it, it depends. Okay. I, mean, I think it, it's. I think some are 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 motivated. Right. Um, Francis Burdett O'Connor, for instance, mm. is a another officer who fights in South America. He ends up living in Bolivia, oh. but he initially is is determined. I mean, he says in his own. Um, autobiography that he he basically goes out to South America to learn the skills of warfare with which he can take the fight back oh, to the okay. British. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, that never happens. He ends up yeah. he he does quite well or relatively well in in what the post war post wars of independence scene mm. in 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 South America is pretty treacherous and civil war wreaks havoc, havoc in the post-independence era across South America. Mm -hmm. um, but he do, he managed to navigate his way through and he, he doesn't end up returning. But hmm. others others return, they, they take one look. Uh, there are some officers, Anglo-Irish officers who are recruited, um, some Anglo-Irish, some Irish Catholics, mm -hmm. um, who who take one look at conditions on the ground in in Venezuela and say, no, I'm, I'm off. And they yeah. either go, some of them try to get back to Britain yeah. and, and, and Ireland. Others, in fact, end up in uh, in, in in the United States. OK, yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, there's not, there are that different one. motivations. It's yeah. sporadic. Some stay, some go. Yeah. Um, and everything is quite fluid, I think. It's, okay. it's, it's not, it's not like, <clears throat> the mid nineteenth century, the eighteen forties, the you know the 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 immigration yeah. during the famine, where it's yeah it's kind of a one way traffic and for one reason. This is much more much more fluid, and it's 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 we're talking fairly small numbers, right? Yeah, uh, except yeah. until when we get to the nineteenth century, the same kind of period mm. when you see you do you do see a kind of sustained emigration to to Argentina, which is much more similar in scope to to that. If not the same numbers by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but a kind of a similar mass exodus towards Argentina, Argentina. because uh, they know of the network, you know. But that's yeah. when that's that's later on. You find okay in, in the nineteenth century, you find emigration to Argentina from Ireland. From in fact, it's interesting from specific parts of Ireland, from the Midlands, wow. from Wexford. Um, and they, you know, they're drawn to Argentina, which is a growing economy because of, um, primarily because of uh, meat exports. Mm -hmm. And they end up on the Pampas and you find this particularly uh, Hiberno-Argentine identity, which is, I mm -hmm. suppose, and so it's never as strong because for obvious reasons, the immigration to 
to the United States. Yeah. You know, we share uh, a common culture, most importantly, the language. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so the the Irish identity amongst those in Argentina perhaps is fainter, but it's it's it remains generation after generation. And oh. I, and it's when I was in Buenos Aires uh, launching the book several years ago, you know, there were there were people coming up to me asking me to identify heirlooms that they had passed on from generation to generation wow. from the late 1870s and 1880s and they said you know where that might come I, I, I had no idea, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> things have changed in Ireland in the last hundred years but yeah. there was a sense of wow. I think perhaps you know I, I I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Irish American communities in, in oh. the United States but in Argentina there was very much a sense of among some of those that I met some, you know, like any, yeah, like anything, you don't want to be to generalize too much, but there was a sense of Ireland as this, this, this kind of Ireland of <clears throat> a devil air is Ireland or an Ireland of the 1850s, which is. Yeah. More much vanished. And, yeah. There's very little left of that. So it's, uh, yeah. um, but it, it was noticeable that even though perhaps, you know, there were Spanish speaking, some had no English. Mm. Um, in Argentina, though they there there is there there, there are for instance hurling clubs, oh, wow. uh, GA clubs, um, mm-hmm. that have existed for some time in Buenos Aires. Even so, the connection was 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 still was still strong. Strong, yeah. Um, and I'm I'm led to believe, for instance, that 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 in certain parts of the Pampas, they still spoke with some communities for generations spoke with the same accent from. Wow, a, a, a particular type of Midlands accent or, or yeah. the Wexford accent. So yeah, um, like that was... happens in Newfoundland. You know, there's pockets yes. of, like Waterford. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that that that's a kind of a later emigration that starts to take place post independence, okay. post Argentine independence. Yeah, um, in in from Ireland to to Argentina. Yeah. Well, you know, as someone who studies 19th, in particular, uh, century immigration from Ireland to America, it sounds like the opportunities the immigrants right the way from the 1600s, you know, all the way up to the 19th century, 20th century in Latin America, they there were more, um, there was more upward mobility, you know, like if you were a career soldier, you could advance through the ranks, or if you were, you know, a, a merchant or a trader, there's money in that. And a lot, you know, the book features a lot of the diplomats, particularly, as you said, when they're winning freedom. So there is maybe an, an anti-monarchy, excuse me, an anti-monarchy strain that is possibly informed by, you know, being Irish, <laughs> um, even though they have right. been quite loyal to the crown. But then as they're putting down roots in the new country, they don't want to be part of a colony. Over well, the there. Irish, the Irish that are, I mean, the Irish do deal with a fair amount of uh, suspicion and hostility because you have people that are, for instance, soldiers, which is that occupy positions mm-hmm. of great power within these, um, I suppose, these particular. Um, citadels of authority in Lima or, or I mean there's great resentment if oh, mm-hmm. if you have an Irishman arriving and he's taking he's occupying the the the, the premier seat of yeah. power in the in the colony and he's doling out favors to all his his family and, and yeah. friends. So there is a certain amount of um hostility mm-hmm. but and and there's also suspicions towards the Irish because even though the Irish are accepted within um, Spanish monarchy because of their religion, mm-hmm. there's also a certain amount of hostility towards them in the 18th century because of the links to to England, who are Spain's mm-hmm. traditional great enemy. So, you know, the, the Ambrose O'Higgins, for instance, is commonly called the English Viceroy, and you know, mm-hmm. a lot of the Irish immigrants are referred to as Ingleses. They're they're lumped in together, mm-hmm. um, and there are great there, there, you know, there's there's a lot of people writing letters back to Madrid in the 18th century when a an Irishman is appointed governor of a, a Caribbean island or, a, you know, a, 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 perhaps a specific city in Florida mm. when it's under Spanish control. Mm-hmm. There are letters being written back saying, "Why are you, why are you appointing an Irishman to mm. to this position? You know, 
are you not worried about um, treachery and you know it's yeah. it's, a, it's a threat to the security of 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 of, of the borders here. So it's <laughs> oh, it, it's 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 not without its its. Uh, uh, problems at being Irish in, in, yeah. in, but they are very much, they are accepted. Mm -hmm. And most, you know, it, it, the Spanish monarchy is obsessed with blood and where you come from. And are, are you pure Catholic blood? Do you have mm -hmm. any Muslim blood? Do you have any Jewish blood? So mm -hmm. with these Irish, with these Catholics, they're coming from Ireland. They don't, I suspect, don't quite know. Where they're coming Definitely. from, but yeah, they they're 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 very ignorant. Yeah. In some ways, helps the Irish because they're able to say, "Well, I come from generations." They have to prove, obviously, they come from generations of Catholic. You know, you have to prove that you're Catholic and you're yeah. Catholic going back generations. Yeah, but because of what happens in Ireland in the 17th century, it you know, I, I, candidates to various positions in the army or for, mm. say, entrance to certain orders of nobility can say, well, you know, I have all this testimony from these people that are, are very important merchants and priests and all the records have been destroyed during the, the tumult of the war, various wars. Yeah. But, you know, these are my bona fides and they need talented people, so they, they accept them. And then, so that's, I suppose... But they become they become Hispanicized. They become yeah. You know there, there there isn't. I mean there are of, of those that become servants of the Spanish crown. There, there's you know there there aren't. They're pretty much acculturated. They're not. Yeah. They're not forming. They're not forming Irish communities. And they're no. all. They're all. Um, I mean, it, it, I think it's slightly different with the the merchant communities. Mm -hmm. Um, but. In terms of those soldiers who are those networks of soldiers, they are there for much. They they become agents of power, if you like. Okay, yeah. And Tim, you bring up an interesting point there about the fact that they do become, you know, kind of Spanishized. Or uh, I presume there isn't a whole pile of women. I know that we'll talk about one or two of the famous examples, but they're having to marry Spanish women over there like they're you know they're not really irish women coming unless they're already married perhaps in ireland not not really no there, yeah. there's obviously obviously families are emigrating during the the 19th century there are women emigrating yeah in the 19th century to argentina i'm not an expert on the 19th century i'm much more earlier kind I've, of I've, I've i've done most of most of my the books i've published have been touched upon earlier periods the colonial period so yeah um the the argent the argentine immigration of the 19th century is is post independence but mm -hmm. there would be i pres a lot of the time there are women going out at the beginning i know mm. um you know a lot of the time men will go out first and mm -hmm. and um wives children might follow but in 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 the 19th century i know some of the early the earliest immigrants to argentina some of them were were women um mm -hmm. but by and large in the 18th century. I mean, you know, one of the problems here is that the records tend to, what records exist, tend to relate to those in positions of, of power, um, yeah. the elites. Yeah. So you're not seeing, there are records, I mean, there are, that, that, that touch upon um, some of those emigrants, for instance, there are those that are find, found in trying to, strike it rich in the mines in Mexico mm. and, and, and mm -hmm. Peru and you see them in some court records but mm -hmm. they're, they're, there's much work to be done in, in terms of um, women's experiences in colonial Irish women's experiences in colonial yeah. um, Latin America Well and Bernardo O'Higgins, his mother was Spanish um, is, is Bernardo the nephew Chile of or Bernardo, yeah. Bernardo's, Bernardo's mother was Chilean his father was Ambrose. Yeah. And Bernardo is perhaps the most, one of the most famous figures in the history of colonial, uh, the Irish colonial Latin American experience. Or okay. Wars of independence anyway, because he was the son of the Viceroy Ambrose O'Higgins. 
Yeah. Um, he had a fractious relationship with his father. His father, um, his mother uh, um, was a, a the daughter of a member of the Chilean gentry in the late 18th century Chile. And his father was a soldier at that stage. And Bernardo was born out of wedlock. Mm. This The father was frightened that this would damage his career prospects. So he basically took the child at an early stage, had him educated in Chile, then in Peru, and then he sent him off to, to, to Spain. And then from Spain, he went to London. And in London, he came under the influence of one of the um, foremost um, revolutionaries of that period, a man called Miranda, Francisco de Miranda. Mm. And Bernardo became imbued with these kind of revolutionary ideology that was... Um, existed in London at that time and he he went back to to Chile and when his father died he inherited his father was a very wealthy man he inherited mm. his estate in Chile mm. and um but he was he was very much convinced that uh in order for Chile to prosper and for yeah. his particular the landowning class in particular to prosper they needed to break the link with with Spain and he becomes um in some ways drawn into that fight at first he's he's on the margins mm -hmm. but as the war progresses in chile he becomes um centrally involved he's one of the foremost generals in some of the main battles during the chilean war of independence and he becomes the first leader of of post-war chile mm. um so his name is is well known throughout chile o'higgins is famous it's um it lends its name to the main the main thoroughfare, which goes through the, the capital of Chile, Santiago, is named after O'Higgins. A, a region of Chile is named after O'Higgins. Oh. He's a he's a controversial figure in many respects in Chile, but mm. um, he is the central figure, if you like, of that period. Um, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you something about the but it, we mightn't have the answer because it was earlier. Was there, is there anything written about, um, you know, the relationship the Irish had with the indigenous peoples or are they already so marginalized, you know, through the earlier kind of conquistadors that there isn't much interaction? Well, there's a lot of interaction. Oh, there is. A, <laughs> a lot of it's pretty brutal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've got to remember that the Irish are throughout the Caribbean uh, yeah. are, well, in South America, in the early days of the the, the conquest, um, you know, there's, there's a genocide in South mm -hmm. America, um, and, and Irish, Irish are there. and Irish missionaries are participating in the yeah. the, the colonization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, the, the in many respects, the the evangelization of the the indigenous peoples of South America is a a veil behind which the, the Spanish colonize, yeah. um, brutally subjugate the indigenous peoples of South America. Uh, I mean, in 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 the 18th century, for instance, you find someone like Ambrose O'Higgins to return to me. I mean, I'm particularly interested in mm -hmm. both Ambrose O'Higgins and his son. Uh, he's he makes his he he makes his career by um by showing the the court in Madrid that he can keep the south of Chile. The, the Spanish managed to subjugate most of the territory that they control in South America mm. by this period in the 18th century, but they can never they can't they can't subjugate the Mapuche in the in the south of Chile. Mm -hmm. Um who to who to this day in in in, in Chile and, and Argentina have have resisted um, uh, their subjugation um, mm. by by the Spanish and subsequent governments, independent governments in that area. Mm. Um, so he, but he proves to the, or at least he 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 tries to prove that he's the man that can that can pacify them both mm. through their mm, subjugation in in war, um, but also he he sells the idea that. In order for the border, because he's obsessed in the 18th century 
with Chile being the southern part of Chile, the Pacific. You've got that long, if you think of Chile, mm -hmm. this long sliver of a country. He's obsessed, and so is the, or so are the, 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 the course in Spain with that long coastline. That's perfect place for the British to invade and begin mm -hmm. an invasion of South America, which pushes up to the north. So he's absolutely um, convinced that in order for the 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 Spanish Spanish America to be protected from mm -hmm. its enemies and your its European enemies, you need to pacify and control the south of Chile. Mm -hmm. And so he he sells the idea that instead of violently trying to Though he's not averse to it when he when it suits him, but instead of mm -hmm. trying to violently constantly subjugate them and beat them into the ground, that you need to you need to also talk to them and 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 talk to the the indigenous peoples and try and negotiate a way mm -hmm. of um, of 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 a common future, if you like. He he ends up also um, abolishing the the encomienda, which is um, particularly egregious. Um, a part of colonial history, Spanish colonial history, in which um, the indigenous peoples were forced to to work for Spanish landowners. Mm. Um, but he, you could say that he's he's, I suppose, a prime example of this kind of um, enlightened despotism that mm -hmm. comes to the fore during the Bourbon period in 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 Spanish America mm. in the kind of the second half of the. The Bourbons are in power in Spain in the 18th century, but begins to, you know, from the as this as the century goes on, mm -hmm. that they they realize they have to modernize. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, he's 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 nothing but not a pragmatist in that respect. But you know, it, 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 the history of the Irish in 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 Spanish America is similar to to that. You know, in in Spanish America in the in the turn of the, the century, in the 18th century, the early 19th century, you know, you have Irish plantation owners mm -hmm. in in areas, you know, areas that belong, that became part of the South, but South of the United States, but were then under the control of, of the Spanish. So places like Louisiana, mm -hmm. Florida, you've got large plantations, which are, um, which are owned by Irishmen. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's that's a and that's a it's a particularly interesting area. I mean, it's uh, you've got an area of the Southwest United States, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, mm -hmm. um, Georgia, and this there's a there's a there's a there's a fight for control of between the Spanish and the Anglo's, mm -hmm. and into this mix you can throw the Irish who are. It's quite interesting because the Spanish, yeah. for instance, in, in Louisiana, when the Spanish take control of, of Louisiana in the in the 18th century, towards the end of the 18th century, there's obviously a lot of French settlers, there's English. The Spanish send Irish missionaries to oh. try and turn these French and English settlers to Hispanicize them, to acculturate them. Yeah. Um, that's the, that's the best way they see of, of winning the loyalty of these people who don't want the Spanish there at all. Yeah. So the Anglo's the Anglo's are coming in from the north, from the from the 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 east. Yeah. Um, and increasingly, you know, Texas. There's all the foment that happens in Texas, and um, yeah. and the Irish are there looking for for opportunities. I think, in my view. The, the more astute ones see that they can operate between all yeah. these competing interests. Yeah. Uh, actually, the Irish in Texas... Um... And, and those, sorry, just to make a point, those Irish are coming through from... They're not just they're not just Irish people coming at that stage from... from you know, they're, they're not coming necessarily from, from Spain. Yeah. Or from, you know, they're not... Some of them are soldiers who are... Uh, who have been sent from Spain and have perhaps... Late, laterally, most of them quite loyal to Spain, but you also have Irish who are coming down from the United States, Irish emigrants to the United States, some of whom who find a more congenial atmosphere in Spanish America at that time, or see opportunities in yeah. in 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 Latin America. So that it all feeds into what's yeah. taking place in in those in the early parts of, I suppose, 
North American history. If we, yes, if we, mean, yeah. if we mean by American the history of the United States. Yeah. Well, and that's, I was going to say that some of the flashpoints like the San Patricios, you know, in, in the Mexican American army, um, the whole Texas, that's, you know. That's a very good example because the San Patricios yeah. are Irish immigrants that um, arrive in the United States, recruited into the United States army. Mm -hmm. And pretty feel pretty much feel alienated because of their religion, yeah. Um, and made to feel like second class citizens. And during the Mexican American War, again for a variety of reasons, but perhaps certainly one of them is is their common religion. Mm -hmm. uh, some there is testimony that points to the fact that they feel alienated by the Protestant officers and. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like the treatment they're getting, whether it be racist treatment or whether they feel that the discipline they're 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 they don't particularly like the discipline in the U.S. Army. They, yeah. they jump ship and go to the Mexicans, yeah. and they they there's a, a man called John Riley from Clifton and Galway who oh. who forms a, a, a initially an artillery unit which becomes a battalion which has a an Irish ethos and Irish culture. There's a he, 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 the, the San Patricios fight for the Mexicans in the Mexican-American War mm -hmm. under a banner with uh, an, an image of St. Patrick and the wow. harp. Um, and they do feel, even though they're they're not just Irish, there are others, there are other mm -hmm. Europeans fighting in that battalion, but they're majority Irish, Catholic Irish. Mm -hmm. and, and they feel very much a common mm -hmm. bond mm -hmm. um, with with the Mexicans. Yeah. And am I right uh, that some of the men were lynched or hanged like for desertion by the American army, the Irish? They were. They were. There's a, yeah. there's a particularly brutal uh, yeah. series of executions which took yeah. place. They were hung as deserters. They were regarded mm -hmm. as traitors because they they had deserted from the U.S. Army. Yeah. And, and this is the middle of the famine, you know, <laughs> like the Irish anyone who hasn't, I don't, anyone who, who, who who hasn't heard it should should try and find the um the chieftain's album oh. uh which done with Ry Cooter oh which, yeah which yeah. uh, celebrates the San Patricios it's oh. it's fantastic oh cool. Liam, again getting back to Liam Neeson this is <laughs> Liam ne Liam Neeson hour. he 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 does a little piece uh, during one of the songs oh it's good. a spoken word piece which um begins one of the songs but it's it's oh, great. it's it's absolutely it's absolutely fantastic good good well another way to to get the history in uh yeah. it, so well i'll just ask you about two more people because i'm interested in the kind of um the tragic story of one of the women but the other thing is it true that zorro may have been an irish man <laughs> uh that's uh, i don't know how how yeah <laughs> there, there, there is a theory that that yeah. zorro um, was inspired by a character called William Lampert, who oh. um, was an emigrant from Wexford, again, emigrated to Spain and ended up in Mexico. Wow. Um, and he ended up in, uh, he ended up dying in Mexico. He was, he was imprisoned by the authorities there in the 17th century uh -huh. um, as being a conspirator. Um, mm. He wanted to, he wanted to create a, an independent Mexico. Okay. Um, and one theory has it that he's the inspiration for for Zorro. <laughs> oh. A very interesting, a very interesting character, but a, a bit of an outlier. Yeah, yeah. And then the other one is um, Camilla O'Gorman, who uh, I believe was executed. You know, kind of horrifically um, in Argentina. That's, is yeah, that's, that's the well, Cam 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 Camilla O'Gorman, I suppose. Yeah. Points to. I mean, it, it points to the kind of society that existed mm -hmm. in, in in these Irish American communities in post independence Argentina in the eighteenth century. Okay, um, and she she was a young girl who's um, from um, fairly uh, wealthy, I suppose, middle class family in 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 Argent in Buenos Aires, and she ran away mm -hmm. um, with. Her lover, who was a priest, mm -hmm. and uh, they went undercover because they knew that this created incredible scandal at the time. Mm. Um, she became pregnant. 
the they were eventually found. Uh, they were teaching in a teaching impoverished children in a, in a small community north of Buenos Aires, mm. and they were brought back to 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 uh, to Buenos Aires and ordered executed. And and she was pregnant at the time. And the ones that 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 uh, ratted them out, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. were were was an, it was an Irish priest who who, who recognised them. So it's a pretty sordid chapter in the history of um, yeah. the Irish Church in oh in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we better talk about to end on a happier note because that's a bit tragic. Um, Eliza Lynch is quite famous too. I think you know as. But well, she's not particularly. That's not a particularly happy story either. But oh, it's not she, okay. Uh, great. <laughs> no. The picture. Well, Eli uh, Eliza saying. Lynch. <laughs> Eliza Lynch. Yeah, Eliza Lynch uh, was born in Cork. She was oh. the daughter of a a. She was born in Charleville in Cork. Um, the daughter of a doctor, and she. Uh, found herself in in Paris in the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, she she was married to initially a, a French um, French soldier French soldier in 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 Paris, and she was abandoned. And anyway, okay. she managed to meet the son of a Paraguayan general, mm -hmm. and ended up in Asuncion, where she became his consort. Um, his oh, name yeah. was uh, Lopez. His name was mm -hmm. and. She became this glittering society figure, the most important person in Asuncion in, in Paraguay. Paraguay is a landlocked country. Mm. Um, so uh, she became this incredibly glamorous celebrity in mm. in, in Paraguay. Um, and they were, she was importing all sorts of luxury items from Paris. And... Um, mm. Quite a quite a celebrated figure in her day in in, mm -hmm. in this particular part of South America, but unfortunately her her lover Lopez, who was a dictator in Paraguay, um, ended up in a war with oh. Brazil and Argentina, and it didn't go well for Paraguay. They <laughs> they were obliterated, and he died, and. Eliza's son was killed and she ended up back in in France so it's it's quite a sad story as well yeah. but she was it's a very interesting story um don't think we have now time now to talk about no, it but it's well but worth she has a huge reversal of fortune you know even though she was she did it's a fascinating story it's a yeah. fascinating story Eliza Lynch it's not it, it again it's 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 one of these stories that is well worth um digging out it's perhaps not particularly representative of the broader themes in the no. relationship between Irish and Latin America, but she's an extraordinary woman, and yeah. um, there's quite a few books have been written about her, so it's, it's yeah, worth, well worth looking into her story. Um, yeah, her, her and Lola Montez, and so it's amazing how these Irish women, you know, loving powerful men that are maybe semi dangerous, <laughs> you know. But yeah. and there's a, in to, I mean, in terms of, I mean, I think one of the um. What you do find as well, it doesn't specifically relate to South America, but you find, um, I've been doing some research, and there's quite a few um, in 18th century Spain, you find a lot of women who are related to um, men in who were quite prominent in trade between South America and Spain at that period. Uh -huh. And, you know, their their roles are the, the, the father's, um or the 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 father figures in the in the in these kind of households or wider family networks expect them to marry mm -hmm. certain people um to benefit benefit commercial um arrangements extend yeah. networks so on so forth but you find a lot of them in 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 mid to late 18th century Spain becoming very um much involved in in kind of uh, Spanish literary scene. So there's quite a few prominent names with uh, uh, of, of prominent uh, women uh, writers, um, uh, poets in that period with with Irish surnames. Mm -hmm. um, which points, I think, to the fact that they're trying to break out of these roles in yeah. in in that are ascribed to them by their close male relatives, but also perhaps 
their the fact that they are um they, they they're they're influenced by the cosmopolitan nature of the 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 environment around them as in their yeah. cosmopolitan cities like Cadiz and in and, and Seville in the south of yeah. Spain where there's there's all sorts of coming and goings across the Atlantic and they're open to new ideas. And, yeah. Um yeah. so that, that 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 that's quite interesting, I think. It is like I say, it's a very different experience, um, particularly for members of our museum, you know, who are used to our own story of the Irish in in North America. There, there is um, a lot more opportunity. It sounds because it it just is a different kind of immigration, you know. It's, so it's it's not the canal workers and the maids and and you know what we're sort yeah. of familiar with. It's the sense of adventure, and I think that's an excellent point that you've just raised. You know, this idea of cosmopolitan you know you're you're a trader but you're dealing with muslims and jewish people and the royal court and you know all these other influences so there's a lot of opportunity there I, if you're able i think to... you can i think you can extend that point i mean about the irish and generally when it comes to latin america because they mm. are they are starting off most of them having to reimagine themselves in places like cadiz or madrid mm. or you know these centers of empire or centers of and the Atlantic trade, where there's all sorts of people, all sorts of influences. They're not, um, you know, they're not constricted communities. They're not very mm. conservative communities. In, in one sense, it's very conservative, but in, a, in another sense, everything is quite mobile. It's much more mm -hmm. mobile than we might imagine. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're, these ideas of identity that we have, which begin to form kind of in the 19th century they're, I think they're more Irish people have a much more mobile sense of their identity they can be many things at once yeah they're not just they're they're not just Irish they can be Irish English Spanish Chilean Argent you know Argentine yeah. at the same time maybe, yeah you know, depending is, on the depending on the context of oh, the context yeah and who they yeah. need to kind of yeah. yeah I think that's fascinating um because and they it, don't necessarily they don't necessarily lose that sense of being Irish but they it's not it's it's not it's that the sense of identity has become a lot more rigid later on. I, I, I think. Yeah. And in those days, you can be, you know, you can be, you can be many things all at once. Yeah. But isn't whereas, that telling too about, you know, the fact that there is opportunity and whereas, you know, maybe if you're living in an Irish ghetto in Boston or New York, you, you know, you feel your Irishness because you have been. That's true. Yeah, that's a, yeah. It, it, exactly. I mean, that's, that's the point that even if you are say someone living in a, in an in you know in, in a community like that in in say the latter part of even the 20th century perhaps in many ways your worldview is more constricted than someone yeah. that's living in in a society which in on the surface seems very very constricted and mm -hmm. women have to are only allowed out of the house at certain times but their worldview is in yeah. some ways broader kind of they they, they, they they have a broader worldview because mm -hmm. of the kind of people that are they're coming through the communities yeah yeah mm. seems a bit more sophisticated so um tim thank you very much this was fascinating i think you know as i said we're it's a new topic for us here um are you working on anything at the moment or you know is that i am i continue to work <laughs> on i can I'm, I'm i've written i've written two books one which continues on the expands on the topic of paisanos mm. uh, which is about a broader uh, I look back to kind of the earlier period of um, the the Irish experience in in colonial Latin America, mm -hmm. and another one which is doesn't really have an Irish theme, but is about American imperialism, uh, oh, which is about say the Paraguay expedition to uh, uh, which was which was launched in the nineteenth century, mm. uh, and I am now writing a book about. Um, which touches upon the the relationship between the O'Higgins as Ber, uh, Bernardo oh. and um, his his father and, Ambrose. Mm -hmm. Wow! So at some You're stage, I, at some <laughs> stage, I hope to return to the Americas. I haven't been over for a while, but yeah, be it well, north or know, south. It sounds like there's plenty of food for thought, and you know, you haven't even touched on the 20th century. It would be interesting to see, you know, in Allende's kind of world or Peron. You know, are, are there any of these? Uh, you know, Irish contingents kind of still involved, but we won't start there. <laughs> so thank you. No, very I, I much. just, I, I just, so in Latin, I mean, one thing I would say okay. to, to end is that, you know, it's, I think it's often very important to look at, try and see everything in its, in its whole, uh, you know, that, that, that they all connect. I mean, emigration to 
uh, to the Irish immigration during the famine doesn't exist within one silo. It's connected to all the other parts that go on leading up to, you know, yeah. the, the, the the era of revolutions and the early history of the United States. And they all feed into one another. It's much more it's much more joined up than one might think yeah. at, a, at an initial glance. And that. Yeah. Um, diverse too, Tim. I think we tend to think, you know, and it wasn't until I immigrated myself, you know, and it's such a buzzword, but I think we forget about the agency sometimes of the immigrant. Like we, you know, we all think we piled on to coffin ships and, you know, we're clutching our breasts and crying as we swayed across. Not everybody was sad to leave, you know. <laughs> so, exactly. Like That's it's very, very important to, no matter whether it was during the Great Hunger or earlier, you know, some people yeah. wanted to go for not just because of, you know, the persecution at home or whatever. So I think that's always an interesting, you know, that the human story is way richer than the kind of exactly. two dimensional, you know, stock figure that we think about. But yeah. thank you um, for coming on. And thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, stay tuned, guys. We have more talks coming up at the end of the month. Uh, we've got Professor. Charlotte Killeen from Trinity College talking to us about Bram Stoker for Halloween. So keep an eye on that one. But thank you. Um, let me just pause.